المكلفين يتعلموا دينهم ما يتفقهوا في دينه كل واحد من الرجال والنساء عليه يتفقه في دينه عليه يتعلم ما لا يسعه جهله هذا واجب لانك مخلوق لعباده الله ولا طريق الى معرفه هذه العباده ولا سبيل اليها الا بالله ثم بالتعلم والتفقه في الدين الواجب على المكلفين جميعا ان يتفقهوا في الدين وان يتعلموا ما لا يسعهم جهله كيف يصلون كيف يصومون كيف يزكون كيف يحجون كيف يامرون بالمعروف وينهون عن المنكر كيف يعلمون اولادهم كيف يتعاونون مع اهليهم كيف يدعون ما حرم الله عليهم يتعلمون يقول النبي الكريم عليه الصلاه والسلام من يريد الله به خيرا يفقه في الدين يا طالبا للعلم يرجو نفعه اسمع نصيحة ناصح معواني أخلص لربك في أمورك كلها فالمخلصون هم أولو العرفان فالجهد في جمع العلوم يضيع إن حل الرياء دواخل الإنسان واحفظ زمانك رأس مالك إنه هبة العظيم الواحد المنان ساعات يومك منحة ذهبية والناس بين الربح والخسران وعليك بالخنق الكريم مع التقى وعليك بالأدب الرفيع الشان واحفظ كتاب الله واستمسك به فالعلم كل العلم في القرآن واطلب صغار العلم قبل كباره واحفظ متون العلم بالإتقان وإذا طلبت العلم فاعرف قدره وأت البيوت أخي من البيبان جالس شيوخ العلم وانهل منهم واظفر أخي بالعالم الرباني واحفظ وداد الشيخ صاح فإنه بعد الأبوة في المقام الثاني من لم يوقر شيخه أستاذه آلت عواقبه إلى الخذلان واعمل بعلمك في شؤونك كلها واشغل زمانك في رضا الرحمن وأمر بمعروف وحارب منكرا كن ناصحا للناس كل زمان وإذا بلغت من العلوم نصابها أد الزكاة أخي بلا كتمان وسهل بها إليه وصولا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله بشر وأنذر لا خير إلا ذل الأمة عليه ولا شر إلا حذرها منه فصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهداه إلى يوم الدين نسأل الله جل وعلا أن يبصرنا بالحق 
وأن يمن علينا بالالتزام به والثبات عليه حتى يتوفانا وهو راض عنا اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا وقلبا خاشعا وعملا متقبلا اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا تجعل فينا شقيا ولا محروما اللهم امين. All praise is due to Allah. We praise Him. We worship Him. We seek His assistance. We seek His tawfiq. We pray to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us that which is beneficial to us. And we pray to Him to give us the tawfiq to apply it. بينه من يريد الله به خيرا يفقهه في الدين اللهم فقهنا في الدين اللهم لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما Tonight is the 21st of the Qi'da of the year 1444 since Hijrah al-Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم which translates into the 11th of June of the Gregorian calendar, 2023. I pray to Allah Azza wa to make this night a blessed night and to make all the brothers and sisters who are physically with us in this masjid or might be tuning in live. I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal to make them mubarakeen, blessed in themselves and in their families. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep giving us the tawfiq to sit around these circles of knowledge which are circles of dhikr of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala that are witnessed by the angels, showered by the mercy of Allah azza wa jalla, and we pray to Him to make <coughs> our jaliza, our reward when we are done here, is that it would be said to us, go for you have been forgiven, Allahumma ameen. This is the 24th majlis, or sitting, of the series about the events of the events of from the Islamic history after after the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But uh, Subhanallah, as I was on my way to the masjid, I thought to myself, uh, we are getting very close, about a little little over a week uh, before the end of the Qada and the beginning of the Hijjah, and that is a mosim and mawasim al khayrat. Um, so I thought, you know, we could remind ourselves. Uh, remember among ourselves the virtues of that and what's at stake because wallahi, this is from the grace and the bounty of Allah and from His mercy. Uh, and this is what to be happy about. But the believer is the one who is uh, happy at the bounty and at the mercy of Allah more than he or she is happy about anything else. A lot of people are happy about amassing wealth and about uh, yeah, uh, uh, making money and, and a lot of fortune in this life. This is what they're happy about and this is what they're happy that makes them the happiest. As for the believer, he is or she is uh, somebody who they are re they rejoice at the bounty and the mercy of Allah wa ta'ala as Allah Azza wa Jal said, قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ فبذلك فليفرحوا ذلك هو خير مما يجمعون It is in the bounty and the mercy of Allah عز وجل that let them rejoice uh, It is better than what they يعني, amass and accumulate And indeed يعني, it is the bounty from Allah عز وجل He didn't have to offer us this opportunity He didn't have to And it is mercy because Allah عز وجل knows our weakness and knows our shortcomings and know our dire need to make up for that. That we need every now and then a season, a time frame, or an opportunity where we can do righteousness and be rewarded greatly by Allah wa ta'ala to make up what we missed, to make up what we sinned, and to make up how what we wrong ourselves with, and to make up for our shortcomings, because even falling short is something that is of a deficiency something of a deficiency in the in the servant of Allah Azza wa Jal. So we pray to Allah Azza wa Jal to keep giving us opportunities. Uh, but it is not enough to just witness opportunity. Allah Azza wa Jal is giving us this opportunity to witness a season of khair that is fast approaching. But what is the point of witnessing a season of khair but then not benefit, not appreciate?
appreciated. Not appreciated as it should be, and not benefit from it, and let this opportunity to slip from literally from beneath, from يعني, um, from between our 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 fingers and our uh, يعني, from in front of us. Uh, a lot of people do that because they don't appreciate, they don't understand what's at stake, they don't understand the virtues of these time uh, time frames that Allah which has given merits and uh, excellence. Uh, relative to other time frame in Allah Azza wa Jal وَرَبُّكَ يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاء وَيَخْتَارُ And Allah Azza wa Jal creates what, whatever He wishes or what He wishes and He selects yani He prefers certain times over others and certain places over others and attribute extra excellence or extra merits to certain times and places uh, as Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala with Subhanahu wa Ta'ala from the examples and uh, from the instances of the bounties and the mercy of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, it are these 10 days, the first 10 days of the Hijjah that are, like I said, are coming. Tonight is the 21st of the Qirna, so we're talking either 8 or 9 days uh, before the start of the Hijjah. Um, and the first 10 days of the Hijjah are a great season of Khayr. Our righteous, righteous predecessors used to glorify يعظمون three ten day periods three ten day periods three ten days ten day periods the last ten of Ramadan the first ten of the Hijjah and the first ten of Muharram so the last ten of Ramadan the first ten of the Hijjah and the first ten of Shahrullah al-Muharram. These are ten, ten day periods that are mu'azzameen. Yani they are excellent and they have virtue uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal has attributed to them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith which is related by Imam al-Bukhari and Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah in their sunnah. From Hadith Ibn Abbas, he said, Ma min ijami al amal al salim fi hinna ahabu ila Allah min hadihi al ashr, min hadihi al ijami. Qalu ya Rasulullah, wala al jihad fi sabili Allah, qala alayhi salatu wa salam, wala al jihad fi sabili Allah, illa rajul kharaja bi nafsihi wa mali, thumma lam yarja' min dhalika bi shay. يعني he said عليه الصلاة والسلام there are no days in which righteous deeds are more beloved to Allah from those ten days. So the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم they said not even jihad the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم he said عليه الصلاة والسلام not even jihad في سبيل الله except for a man who a man who were to go out with his self and his wealth. And not return from that with anything. Yani, he puts everything for the sake of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. In this hadith, we learned that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the first 10 days of Shahr Allah or Shahr Dhil Hijjah um, a season of khair and a time frame uh, for obedience to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala in which the righteous deeds are more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal than the very same deeds done at any other time. Because he said, alayhi salatu was salam, ahabbu ilallah, yani there are no, right, no other days in which righteous deeds are done more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal. So this tells us that al-a'mal al-saliha, al-khayrat, al-hasanat, al-ta'at, are more beloved, that are performed during these 10 days, the first 10 days of the hijjah are more beloved to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. And as such are also يعني, rewarded more greatly by Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. And so there are no other days in which the righteous deeds are more beloved to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala than, than these 10 days. In this hadith, يعني, just contemplating it very quickly and briefly, um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about three things. Told us about three things. A time, an action, and a reward. The time is the first 10 days of the Hijjah. How do we know that? We know that because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he said this hadith, 
when he said this hadith, it coincided with the beginning ghurrat dhil hijjah, yani with the beginning of the month of dhil hijjah. So this told us, or this tells us, that he, uh, what he meant by these 10 days, it refers to the first 10 days of dhil hijjah. So this is the time frame. This is, it, this is the time in which the actions and the righteousness is more beloved to Allah wa ta'ala than any other un, than any other time. As for the reward, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that these deeds, the, the righteous deeds, are more beloved to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. They are more beloved to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. So the very same action, as salah that is performed during these 10 days is more beloved than the salah that is performed at any other day or any other time. The sadaqah that is performed during these 10 days is more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal than the very same sadaqah performed outside of these 10 days. Likewise, for example, as siyam and qira'at al-Qur'an, etc., etc., they are more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal in these 10 days uh, more than any other time. The third thing that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about is the action or the deed, al-amal. And you notice Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا مِنْ أَيَّامٍ الْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحِ Righteous deeds. And in the Arabic language, if you, يعني, if you open the books of al-fiqh, um, al-amal al-salih is one of the terms that is referred to as, uh, this is lafz umum. Umum, يعني, it is a lafz عام, يعني, generic term. A generic term is a term that encompasses any and all of its individual instances. He didn't say salah is more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal. He didn't say siyam, for example, is more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal. He didn't say qiraat al-Quran only is uh, more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal or sadaqah, etc., etc. He said al-amal al-salih, all of the act, all of the righteous deeds. So this is a lafaz am, and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam left it open. He left it wide open. Any amal salih comes under that umbrella of al amal salih. You agree with that? You agree with that? Because it is lafaz umum, يعني يعم. It it encompasses all any action that is deemed in the Sharia as a amal salih, salihat, hasan, hasanat then it comes under that hadith. And as such is more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal than any other, any other day or any other uh, time. Um, and so we can tell as well that this al-amal al-salih can be of two types. The first one is the one that, is with, that we are regular upon uh, any, uh, any day of the year. Yani there are actions that we are regular upon every day of the year. And this would be included in that. For example, the five daily prayers. The five daily prayers we are regular upon every single day, right? There is no day that we don't pray five, five daily prayers. But still, this is included in this hadith and is covered by that hadith. Yani those prayers and their rawatib, yani sunan al-ratiba that is prayed right before or right after and or you know, ratibat al-fajr, ratibat al-dhuhr, etc., etc. Um, as well as, for example, uh, يعني, uh, for example, you know, spreading salam. When you see uh, your fellow Muslim, you say salam alaikum, this is any time, right? So these are from the repetitive action that we are regular, we are regular upon. Qira'at al-Qur'an. It is يعني, so befitting for a Muslim to be regular upon reading and reciting al-Qur'an. And also, although this is something that is repetitive, that still is qualified for al-amal al-salih, that is, if done during these 10 days, it is more beloved to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala than any other, than any other day. The second type is those actions that are specific, that you only do three, uh, during these 10 days, that are specific and appointed to these 10 days of the hijjah For example, uh, al-hajj. Performing al-hajj. Al-hajj obviously is during these 10 days. Um, including, for example, it's uh, offering al-uthiyah, sacrifice of al-uthiyah, to sacrifice for the sake of Allah wa ta'ala. 
For example, the fasting of the, month, of the day of Arafah, which is the ninth of the Hijjah. That is also specific to these 10 days. And these actions are also beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal more than the very same actions, if they were to be offered, if they could be done at any other time, being performed during these 10 days is more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal. So for example, performing al-hajj is more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal than performing nusuk al-umrah during any other day of the year. Performing al-hajj is more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal than performing al-umrah at any other time of the year. Likewise, offering the sacrifice of al-uthiyah, which is specific to these 10 days, is more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal than offering a similar uthiyah outside of these 10 days. You, you, is that clear? All of that is more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal because again, Rasulullah Sallallahu said, ما من أيام العمل الصالح فيهن أحب إلى الله More beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal. There is no other days in which righteous deeds are done that are more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal than these 10 days. And when the Muslim understand and comprehend, comes to this comprehension that these are days in which العمل الصالح is more beloved to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, then this will should definitely fuel their aspiration and make them roll their sleeves and come forward and exert themselves in more actions in more obedience about allah this is an opportunity that allah Azza wa is giving us this is an opportunity and he's bestowing upon us his bounty to make us witness it to make it to make us witness it and really uh, the, يعني, what's at stake is for our benefit. Allah Azza wa is not in need of our ibadat. He is subhanahu wa ta'ala al ghani al hamid. He is ghani from our ibadat. We are the ones who are in need. So imagine Allah Azza wa is giving you an opportunity and then some people, well, billah, this is from the deprivation, from al hirman, say, I'm not interested. Wallahi, this is deprivation. This is al hirman. Na'udhu billah min al hirman. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq. So take benefit as long as Allah Azza wa Jal is giving you the opportunity to witness. Make sure that you actually benefit from these 10 days and to increase in your ibadah during these 10 days. I want to conclude, inshallah, so that we don't take too much time. I want to conclude with three things that I would like, you to, that, that I would like to keep with you. And uh, يعني, it would be beneficial for each one of us to keep them on top of our head that they will يعني, uh, lead us to increase our ibadah during these 10 days. The first one to notice is that uh, doing righteousness is from the shukr of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. يعني, if you want to be really grateful to Allah azza wa jal, truly shakir lillah tabaraka wa ta'ala, then you have to do righteousness and more specifically during these excellent times. During these time frames, Mawasim al Khairat, the season of that are excellent in the eyes of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, like Allah Azza wa Jal said, I'malu ala Dawuda shukra. I'malu, yani amal, out of gratefulness, out of shukr, lillah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. This ayah indicates that al amal al salih is shukr lillah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. So those who work uh, righteous, righteousness, they are the most grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal. Shakirina lillah tabaraka wa ta'ala. May Allah make us among them. The second thing to keep in mind is that this home of a dunya, dar dunya is temporary. It's only a transition. It's a bridge to dar al-akhirah. And whatever you do, whatever you put forward for yourself from the righteous deeds, you will find it with Allah Azza wa Jal. Make no mistake about it. You will find it with Allah Azza wa Jal and it will be uh, recorded for you. Nothing will be overlooked. As Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala said, وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ ثُمَّ تُوَفَّى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ And fear a day when uh, you will be returned to Allah, then every soul will be compensated for what it earned. Good will find good and evil will find evil. But if you did good, then make no mistake, you will be compensated for it on the day of resurrection. 
will become every soul will be compensated for what it earned and they will not be treated unjustly. Yani everything will be accounted for. Everything will be accounted for. Nothing will be forgotten. Nothing will be overlooked. Everything is recorded in details. And you will find every little good deed you did will find it on the day of resurrection. The last thing to keep in mind is that uh, when you know that um, Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala um, has reserved a great reward for those who do righteousness in this dunya, has reserved a great reward, and Allah Azza wa Jal will reward the good doers greatly. As Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala said, وَمَا تَفْعَلُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ يَعْلَمْهُ اللَّهِ and whatever, do, whatever good you do, Allah knows it. And وَمَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ تَجِدُوهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ هُوَ خَيْرًا وَأَعْظَمَ أَجْرًا هُوَ خَيْرًا وَأَعْظَمَ أَجْرًا And whatever good you put forward for yourself, you will find it with Allah and uh, better and greater in reward. Yani Allah Azza wa Jal will reward you greatly. And يعني, multiply the reward for you. And during these days uh, that are excellent in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal, the, the reward will be multiplied even beyond what they are multiplied during other days and times. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to take advantage of these times and of these seasons of al khairat. Um, I apologize that I promise. The, last, the very last thing, inshallah, that I want to uh, remind ourselves is one of the greatest actions that you could do during these 10 days is a takbir, a takbirat, and a tahlilat, and a tahmidat. And a takbir during the 10 days of Ram uh, the, Ramadan, uh, the 10 days of the hijjah are of two types. There is a takbir al mutlaq, and there is a takbir al muqayyad. There is the unrestricted takbir and there is the restricted takbir. What is the difference between the two? A takbir al mutlaq starts from the beginning of the hijjah, from the night of the first of the hijjah, and continues until the maghrib of the 13th of the hijjah. So let, let me just make it clearer. Let's say, for example, for the sake of discussion, uh, the month of the qi'dah, for example. Completed 30 days. Completed 30 days. And the 30th of the Qa'dah was on a Wednesday. So we know that the next day is what? The Hijjah for sure, right? Because it's either 29 days or 30 days. So if Wednesday was the completion of the month of the Qa'dah and it is the 30th, then from that Maghrib on Wednesday, since Thursday is the first of the Hijjah, then from the Maghrib on Wednesday, on the 30th of the Qa'dah, this is when the time for a takbir al-mutlaq starts. And this is a takbir you could, you could say and recite and repeat any time of the day or night. That's why it's called mutlaq. Yani it is not restricted to certain actions. You do them after that. Any time. While you're commuting to work, while you're in the marketplace, while you're going to the masjid to perform the prayer, any time, at takbir al-mutlaq, unrestricted takbir. And it continues until the maghrib, until sunset on the 13th of the hijjah. At takbir al-muqayyad, the restricted takbir, from its name, it is restricted to after the prayers. So this is the takbir that you say after every prayer after the five prayers. And it starts from the Fajr of Yawm Arafah. From the Fajr of Yawm Arafah, which is the ninth of the Hijjah. The ninth of the Hijjah. So after Fajr, after Dhuhr, after Asr, and it continues until the Salat al-Asr on the 13th of the Hijjah. Clear? This is the restricted takbir, which is what you say after the prayers. And like I said, there is a takbir al-mutlaq, which, which can be said any time of day or night, the entirety of that time frame, and the, يعني, the, uh, the form uh, of that takbir, the most common, is Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Wallahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi alhamd. Easy, even easy on the tongue, but this is يعني, a great uh, type of action of righteousness that we can do during the 10 days of the hijjah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us witness them because there is still another eight days or nine days that, that separate us from them. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us witness them and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq 
to do as much as we can to benefit from these 10 days. With that said, inshallah, um, we go back to our topic, which is uh, the events of uh, during the time of the Khilafah of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Yazid ibn Muawiyah. This is something that we already started before the break, if you remember. But just to refresh your memory very quickly, inshallah, so that we can pick up from there uh, and just to refresh this uh, knowledge in your head. Uh, if you remember, uh, Yazid ibn Muawiyah became al Khalifa after his father Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan radiyallahu an passed away. And this was in the year 60 Hijri. This was in the year 60 Hijri. And he was still a young man. He uh, asked that يعني, the Muslim pledge allegiance to him and he nominated his own son, which we said was a change from the way it used to be before. Um, and so most of the Muslim pledged allegiance to him with the exception of a few, the most notables of them are Al Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu an and Abdullah ibn Zubair. These two did not pledge allegiance to him. But they didn't say anything, they didn't do anything, they didn't go out against him or anything. They just didn't pledge allegiance to him, right? And they were at the time in Al Madinah. So they were asked to pledge allegiance and they so they left Al Madinah and they went to Mecca. And the governor of Mecca was a wiser man, and he let them alone. He left them alone. He didn't ask them to pledge allegiance, and things went يعني, peacefully or quietly for some time. Until, and by the way, I want to make a side note very quickly. This is one of the differences, by the way, between Muawiyah and his son Yazid. Muawiyah was a very wise and patient man. Allahu A'lam, I could say that he would have dealt with this situation much differently. Yani they, they're not saying anything, they're not doing anything. No harm. You don't have to, you have, you don't have to yani, insist and yani, order them to pledge allegiance. Khalas, they're not doing anything, leave them alone. But he insisted to that they pledge allegiance. Subhanallah, the people of Al Kufa, uh, they never liked Bani Umayyah to be the rulers. And so when they heard that Al Hussein ibn Ali did not pledge allegiance, they started to write letters to him. And the letters started to come in large numbers. They are asking him to come and they're ready to pledge allegiance to him and they don't want Yazid and they want him to be Al Khalifa. So that got the attention of Al Hussein and he wanted to find out, as we said, obviously I'm going very quickly, inshallah. So he sent his cousin, Muslim ibn Aqil, Muslim ibn Aqil ibn Abi Talib. Right, his cousin. So he sent him to Mac to uh, Al Kufa to find out, to investigate and look into the matter. Are these for real or are these fake? Because obviously, remember back in the days, these letters could be very easily faked. Remember when we talked about during the time of uh, Uthman ibn Affan when people started to spread rumors, and they would write letters, supposedly in the name of Umm al Mu'minin Aisha or from some of the Sahaba, and they never actually wrote them. Right, so they would say this is from Aisha. It's fake. And she never said any, she never wrote any of those letters. So it would have been easy back in the days to actually fake these letters. So he wanted to find out. So he sent his cousin, Muslim ibn Aqil, to find out. And so he went to Al Kufa and entered it. And um, يعني, people started to actually come and pledge allegiance to Al Hussein through Muslim ibn Aqil, right, on behalf of Al Hussein. And he uh, ended up staying at the place of uh, uh, Hani ibn Urwa, one of the chiefs, one of the يعني, nobles of Al Kufa. And people started to come in large numbers to pledge allegiance and whatnot. And uh, at the time, Nu'man ibn Bashir al Sahabi radiallahu an, was the governor of Al Kufa. He learned about, or he learned about the news of what was going on. Obviously, this is not something that you can hide, right? Uh, but he didn't do anything. So certain people from Al Kufa who didn't like that, they went to Yazid and they said, you know, something is being plotted and uh, Nu'man ibn Bashir is not doing anything. He's turning a blind eye. So he removed him and installed Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad in his place. He put him in charge of Al Kufa and he was already a uh, governor of Al Basra. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad was already a governor of Al Basra. So he added Al Kufa under his rule. He, he also made him the governor of Al Kufa. And so he came to Al Kufa during the night and he was masked 
trying to find out what was going on. Is it for real or is it? So as he was passing through, uh, he would greet the people and they would actually return the greeting by saying, وَعَلَيْكَ السَّلَامِ يَبْنَ بِنْتِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ يعني وَعَلَيْكُمُ السَّلَامِ O son of the daughter of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, thinking that he was al Hussein. So he realized that it was for real and something is being plotted and al Hussein is to come to al Kufa. Uh, so he sent his servant uh, called Ma'qil to find out exactly who is in charge of this, if you wish, operation, who's you know, collecting the pledges and whatnot. So he went and pretended to be somebody who is coming from Bilad al Sham and bringing money for uh, al Hussein. To, have, to support al Hussein, So they led him to the house of Hani ibn Urwa, that person where Muslim ibn Aqil was staying. And he gave them the money and he kept يعني, going to, uh, to that house until he learned all of the de details of what was going on, what they were plotting. One, uh, and then he conveyed all of this information to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, the governor. At that time, uh, uh, Muslim ibn Aqil, يعني, he, uh, uh, he sent a letter or, or he sent to Al Hussein saying that يعني, people are indeed wanting you to come and they're ready to pledge allegiance to you, so it is time for you to come. So he sent a letter, he sent a messenger to convey this message that come over, it's ready for you. Uh, at that time, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he sent and arrested Hani ibn Urwa, the, 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 the noble where Muslim ibn Aqil was staying. And he brought him over to, the, to his palace and he asked him, where is Muslim ibn Aqil? He said, I don't know. So he brought his uh, servant, uh, Ma'qil, and he said, do you know this man? He said, yeah, I know. And he told him all, all the details. At that point, obviously, he knew that this was a spy and it was a trick that he was tricked into. So he said, now where's Muslim Ibn Aqil? He said, I wouldn't hand him over to you. If remember we said, even if he was under my feet, I wouldn't lift it. Yani he's not gonna hand over Muslim Ibn Aqil to him. So he put him into, in, in the prison. At that point, Muslim Ibn Aqil, he learned about that and he came with some 4,000 people and surrounded the palace of Ubaidullah Ibn Ziyad. Because all of these who supposedly pledge allegiance to Al Hussein, now they're supporting him. So they came with him and they, they came in force with 4,000 and they surrounded the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. At the time, some of the nobles of Al Kufa were in the palace. So he encouraged them and in some instances he coerced them. Yani he forced them and encouraged them, promising them gifts and whatnot, rewards and whatnot, to go and يعني, make the people go away and desert Muslim Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Aqil to, de, to let them, make them desert him. So each one of those tribe chiefs went out and took his people, all the people. You know, obviously, when the chief of a tribe comes and say, all my people يعني, go away or يعني, retreat from there, obviously most people will, will يعني, obey. And uh, so they started to, يعني, uh, the number to dwindle those 4,000 until they ended up, uh, all of them deserting Muslim ibn, ibn Aqil by, يعني, by Maghrib time, by, the, by Maghrib, by, uh, just be, by, the, by the time the sun was setting, everybody deserted him. He was literally alone, like no one with him. So imagine from 4,000, he ended up alone, nobody with him. So obviously you cannot, what siege? Yani he can't play a si uh, put a siege to a palace on your own. And he was obviously a foreigner. I mean, he's a stranger to, uh, to Al Kufa. He doesn't know anyone over there. So he started to wander in the roads of Al Kufa until he ended up at a place, at a house of a woman uh, from Kinda, Kindiya. And he knocked on her door and he said, A stranger. He said, What is your story? He said, I would just want water. And then he told her the story, I, am, I was sent by Al Hussein and so and so and so forth. And so, forth. so she gave him refuge and she, she said, you can stay there. And then her son, when he came and learned about the stranger, he handed, handed him down to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. He went to, and, tell, to, and told him that he's staying in our place because hoping to get the gift and the reward from, from him that he put forward to whoever would provide any information about Muslim Ibn Aqil. SubhanAllah, wanting a dunya. Anyway, so he sent 70 people and surrounded the house. 
obviously a one person, what can one person do in front of 70 people? No matter how brave, shuja you can be. You know, I mean, <laughs> this is life. So he ended up surrender, sur uh, yani he surrendered to them and they took him to Abd Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. And so the, he asked him, what brought you here? Why are you revolting? Uh, he said, well, we have a pledge of allegiance to al Hussein." He said, Don't, didn't you pledge allegiance to Yazid ibn Muawiyah? He is the Khalifa now. So he said, I am going to kill you. So he said, can I uh, give a wasiyah? Can I leave a wasiyah, a will behind? He said, yes. So he looked around and he saw Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas. This is a man from Quraysh. And so lineage-wise, he was the closest to him because both of them are from Quraysh. Sa'd uh, ibn Abi Waqas, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Umar ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas. Umar ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas. Obviously, he's from Quraysh and he was the closest. So he took him to the side and he said, I already sent a messenger uh, to Al Hussein to come to Al Kufa and think things are ready. Please tell him to go back. Please, because obviously, back in the days, yani when you want to send something from Al Kufa to Al Medina, uh, this is not something instant that can be done or relayed instantly, right? There were no cars, there were no airplanes, there were no TVs, right? It would take at least a few days for somebody to literally travel from here to there, right? So he said, probably by this time, he's already on his way to Kufa. Please send, relay to him to go back and tell him that the people of Kufa, they lied to me and they lied to you, right? And they betrayed us. Uh, uh, Hussein ibn Ali, he left Mecca toward the Kufa on the 8th of the Hijjah. On the 8th of the Hijjah, which is called Yawm al -Tarwiyah. So on the 8th of the Hijjah, he left uh, Mecca toward the uh, Kufa. Uh, uh, Muslim ibn Aqil, when he surrendered and he was taken as, yani, into prison, um, or to, taken into custody to the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. This was on the 9th of the Hijjah, yani one day after al Hussein left Mecca. One day after al Hussein left Mecca. Now, obviously, there is no way for al Hussein to learn about that. Because obviously, there are no you know, satellite TVs where breaking news and whatnot. This was not the case at the time, right? It would take at least a few days, at least a few days for al Hussein to even learn about the this يعني, uh, uh, change of events, right? Because for him, all he knows is that Muslim ibn Aqil, he sent to him that people are coming in large numbers, pledging allegiance, things are ready for you. Uh, it is right for you to come. Things are ready for you. This is, this is, what, this is what he knows, right? But now all of a sudden, within 24 hour period of time, things have changed dramatically, right? But he wouldn't know about, he wouldn't know about that. Um, so, but he told Umar ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, he said, please send a messenger to tell al Hussein to go back. If, he probably already left Mecca, and he did, uh, uh, indeed he did at the time. He said, tell him to go back because uh, they lied to us. They lied to us. So Umar ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, he was an army general in the army of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. In the army of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Yani he was an army general under Yazid ibn Muawiyah, under al-Khalifa. So he, he asked Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, because he's the governor, and he said, should I relay this, this, this information, this message from Muslim ibn Aqeen? He said, yes. He asked him, what is, what is it? He said, he, he, and he's telling me to ask al Hussein to go back. He said, by all means, relay it and tell them not to come because this is what's important. They should just not come to Al-Kufa. And al Hussein should not come to Al-Kufa. And by the way, yani any fair-minded person, any fair-minded person would definitely agree that this tells that they weren't really interested per se to have a fight to actually kill al Hussein, this was not the intention. All they wanted is to prevent him from coming to Al-Kufa, full stop. That's all they wanted. They didn't want things to actually yani, evolve into this dramatic or what it, it, in reality it ended up being, into the dramatic uh, yani, events that, that happened afterward. They didn't want all of that out of fairness, yani, right? 
uh, and Yazid ibn Awiyah did n never order that Al Hussein be killed. All he wanted is to stop him from reaching Al Kufa and to prevent him from entering Al Kufa and to send him back to Al Medina. And if you remember, just to refresh your memory, uh, yani to add to that, if you remember, uh, last time we actually mentioned that when Yazid ibn Muawiyah first heard about the fact that uh, Al Hussein was thinking about going out to Al Kufa, he sent a letter to Abdullah ibn Abbas. He sent a letter to Abdullah ibn Abbas. And Abdullah ibn Abbas was at the time, he was the kind of like the chief of Al Al Bayt. He was the most senior of them. Excuse me. And people from Al Al Bayt would look up to him. And Abdullah ibn Abbas is the, is the, yani the great Sahabi. He, he, he is who he is. Right? He is who he is. And so he sent to him, reminding him of the kinship in between them. And يعني, that, you know, if this thing happened, if Al Hussein ibn Ali would come out, he was afraid that it would lead to fighting and, and, and war and whatnot. And he reminded him of what happened before, right? Uh, يعني, years before and how it, يعني, a lot of people got killed. And he said this would not be good for the relationship and for the kinship that, ex that was among us. So he really wanted to kind of peacefully resolve this. But subhanAllah, يعني, this is what Allah Azza wa Jal will to happen. So uh, the point is that they really wanted originally that things don't get to a, to a point where, to a boiling point, if you wish, to a boiling uh, point. They really wanted, all they wanted is to prevent him and stop him from reaching Al Kufa. A good question would be. Tayyib, what was the position of a Sahaba with respect to that? Were the Sahaba at the time supportive of this move by Al Hussein ibn Ali that he wanted to go out toward uh, Al Kufa, or were they opposing that? That's a very legitimate question. You agree with that? In reality, all of them were opposing that, and they tried to the best of their ability to stop Al Hussein ibn Ali from going to Al Kufa. All of them were on opposition, unanimous opposition. None of them wanted him or agreed or encouraged him to go, to go out. Uh, all of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum wanted, the, wanted to يعني, uh, change his mind and to stop him from, from going out. Um, for example, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr, and even his own brother, or half-brother rather. Remember uh, Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya that we mentioned before. His half-brother, both of them are the son of Ali, but he is from a, another woman, from another uh, woman that Ali ibn Abi Talib married. Even his own half-brother, uh, Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, all of them, they, when they learned about the plan of Al Hussein to go out uh, toward uh, Al Kufa, they all of them wanted to stop him, and they all tried their best to, يعني, change his mind and to stop him. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, يعني, some of the sayings that they actually said, let me, يعني, inshallah, mention some of them, just to show you how hard they tried to stop him. Abdullah ibn Abbas, and Abdullah ibn Abbas is his cousin, right? Abdullah ibn Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn uh, Naam ibn Abdul Muttalib and uh, Al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abu Talib ibn Abdul Muttalib. So they are cousin, right? Uh, and both of them are cousin. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas is a cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Al Hussein is a grandson. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, uh, he said to Al Hussein when he wanted to go out toward Al, uh, al Kufa. He said, لولا أن يزري بي وبك الناس لشبثت يدي في رأسك فلم أترك تذهب. يعني if I weren't afraid and concerned that people would actually يعني look at us and be disrespectful of us, I would have literally, would have literally grabbed your head by my own hands to stop you from going. Look at يعني what extent he wanted to stop him from. I would literally grab your head, grab you by your head and stop you from going to, uh, to Al-Kufa, and as to not let you go. 
But obviously, يعني, imagine somebody doing that. Um, and even he said, يعني, tried to even delay him يعني, in the hope that he would eventually change his mind. He said, why don't, why don't you just wait after Al-Hajj? Remember, I mentioned, when did Al Hussein leave Mecca? On the 8th of the Hijjah. Tayyib, next day, Al Hajj, the A'mal Al Hajj starts. And you could perform Al Hajj in only a few days, few numbered days. So he said, Bad Al Hajj, yani, just wait, perform Al Hajj, and then after that, go. But subhanAllah, he insisted that he would go, and he left, uh, he set out on the 8th of the Hijjah, yani, just before Al Hajj. ليقضي الله أمرا كان مفعولا سبحان الله قدر الله تبارك وتعالى ابن عمر عبد الله ابن عمر um, he said or, or what he did is according to الشعبي الإمام uh, the historian and jurist uh, عامر الشعبي he said كان ابن عمر بمكة uh, عبد الله ابن عمر was in مكة at the time uh, so he learned about the news that الحسين left left Mecca toward, uh, he went out toward uh, Al-Iraq, toward Al-Kufa. So he pursued him. He already left. When he learned, he already left. Al-Hussein already left. So he learned after, after the fact. So he set out and he followed him for three days. Because obviously on the horse or something, right? So it, it takes time to, يعني, uh, get, يعني, to keep up with him or to get to where he is. So he pursued him for three days until he يعني, reached him. And he said, what do you want? Where are you going? So he said, Al-Iraq, Al-Kufa. So he said, uh, and he showed him all of the messages that he received, all of, all of these letters that he received from uh, the people of Al-Kufa. Uh, that they are showing that they are with him and they want him to come and uh, يعني, they want to pledge allegiance to him. So Ibn Umar, he said, don't go to them. Don't go to them. Don't believe them. Uh, but Al Hussein insisted, insisted that he would go. So at that point, Ibn Umar, Abdullah Ibn Umar, he said, I will uh, tell you, relate to you a hadith. Inni muhadithuka hadithan. إن جبريل أتى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فخيره بين الدنيا والآخرة. جبريل عليه السلام. He came to the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام and he gave him the choice to choose between the dunya and the آخرة. So رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اختار الآخرة. رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم he chose الدار الآخرة. ولم يريد الدنيا and he didn't want the dunya. He didn't want the dunya. وَإِنَّكَ بَضْعَةٌ مِنْ And you are from him. يعني you are from his offsprings. You are his grandson. وَاللَّهُ وَاللَّهِ لَا, لي لا يَلِيَهَا أَحَدٌ مِنْكُمْ أَبَدًا By Allah, none of you will get from this dunya ever. None, none of you يعني will get this يعني obvious share of this dunya. وَمَا صَرَفَهَا اللَّهُ عَنْكُمْ إِلَّا لِلَّذِي هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ And Allah Azza wa Jal did not Yani take it away from you, not because he doesn't like you. They are Al Bayt and Nabi Sallam, Ahl al Bayt. But only because Allah Azza wa Jal wanted something better for you. Yani He take it, He took yani, He took Allah Azza wa Jal took this dunya away from you. He didn't put you in charge of this dunya because Allah Azza wa Jal wanted for you that which is far better. Al Akhira. Um Lilladi huwa khairun lakum. فأبى أن يرجع but he سبحان الله he, يعني, he refused to go back and he يعني, insisted that he would go forward so Abdullah ibn Umar he embraced him he embraced him and he shed tears and he said أستودعك الله من قتيل يعني I commend you to Allah's keeping I commend you to Allah's keeping as somebody who will be killed سبحان الله he, يعني, he had such a strong feeling that this is how it's going to end up. And indeed, subhanAllah, this is how it ended up. How, he would, how would Abdullah ibn Umar know all of that? SubhanAllah, it's amazing how they used to know exactly the type of people. They knew who the people of Al-Kufa were. And they knew how disloyal they were. And they knew that they were just lying on al Hussein, and they would never support him. They would never actually translate their messages into actions. And that when it comes down to it, they're going to desert him. 
And what can you do, for example, as, as one person um, or with his, I mean, he went out with his family. It's not like he went out with an army. He went out with his family, with his sons and daughters and, and, and ahl, yani, um, uh, wives, and, and some of his uh, uh, relatives, yani kinship from uh, the sons of Muslim ibn Aqil, the offsprings of Muslim ibn Aqil, and some friends. At most, at most, the historians put the people who accompanied al Hussein at 73. This is about it. Even at 73, by Allah, what can 73 people do in front of an army? A state, we're talking, we're talking you are opposing a complete state with its yani, armies and whatnot. What can you do? I mean, there's no way, right? It's completely, there's no, yani, uh, uh, there is no comparison. There is no comparison. He's not. He's not, but they knew. It, it, absolutely, and exactly. I mean, obviously, he didn't expect all of that, and this is not why he went out. Absolutely, I agree. And, and, and if it wasn't clear from, uh, yani from what I was saying, he was not even thinking about that. But the point, Sahaba, they knew all of that. They knew that this is what's going to happen. And that's why they were all in unanimous opposition to that move and they all tried to stop him we mentioned what abdullah ibn abbas his own cousin said to him we meant we now just mentioned what abdullah ibn umar said to him even more let me get let me let me add to that even abdullah ibn zubair even abdullah ibn zubair and if you remember just to refresh your memory he is the only other notable one who did not pledge allegiance to yazid remember we said two al hussein ibn ali and abdullah Ibn Zubair. Even Abdullah Ibn Zubair, he told him, he said to Hussein, Aina Tadhab, where are you going? So uh, you go to, a, to people who killed your father and tried to kill your own brother Al Hassan. They stabbed him several times. They tried to kill him and assassinate him because they saw that he actually يعني, humiliated them by giving up Al Khilafah to Muawiyah. They didn't like that. They never agreed to that. They said, Ya Mudhil al Mu'minin. This is how they used to call Al Hassan, by the way. Ya Mudhil al Mu'minin. Yani, oh, humiliator of the believers. They tried to kill his own brother. They stabbed him several times. And they killed his father, Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, How do you trust such people? How do you trust? How, how can you go to them and how do you trust them? He said, La tadhab. Don't go. He urged him so much not to go out. Again, Al Hussein, يعني, he insisted that he would go, we would go out. Abu Sa'id al Khudri, Sahab al Jalil, radiallahu anhu. Abu Sa'id al Khudri, he said, Ya Aba Abdullah, the kunya of Al Hussein was Aba Abdullah. He said, Ya Aba Abdullah, inni laka nasih. I am an advisor. I am an advisor. Wa inni alaykum mushfiq, and I, I feel pity for you. يعني I have ishfaq, I have pity for you. قَدْ بَلَغَنِي أَنَّهُ قَدْ كَاتَبَكُمْ قَوْمٌ مِنْ شِيَعَتِكُمْ It came to my attention that يعني certain people from Al-Kufa, uh, يعني from your supporters, and a Shia in this context, not a Shia of today's, يعني the group of a Shia, Al-Khawarij, er, I'm sorry, Al-Rafidah. But a Shia in the Arabic language, it means, it could come and mean supporter, or it could be a follower, or it could be يعني, faction. And this is what uh, he was me he meant by this. يعني, from Shi'atikum, from those who are following, or they claim to be followers, or they claim to be supporters. Uh, like Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, for example, said um, in the ayah, وَإِنَّ مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ لَإِبْرَاهِيمِ وَإِنَّ مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ لَإِبْرَاهِيمِ وَإِنَّ مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ يعني مِنْ شِيَعَةِ نُوح He was referring to Nuh that Ibrahim was from the followers of Nuh يعني on the same deen which is Tawheed Allah Azza wa Jal was referring to Ibrahim as somebody who is on the same path on the same deen as Nuh alayhi salam because before those, this ayah Allah Azza wa Jal was talking about Nuh and then he said وَإِنَّ مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ يعني مِنْ شِيَعَةِ نُوح لَإِبْرَاهِيمِ Ibrahim is from the Shia of 
uh, Nuh, yani from, the, from the followers on the same path, yani from the same deer of the Tawheed. طيب. So he said, it, it came to my attention, or I learned that some people from those who supposedly are yani your followers in Al-Kufa, they are calling you to go out to them. لا تخرج إليهم. Don't go out to them. He said, I am nasih. I am advise, I'm advising you. Don't go out to them. For I heard your father, your own father, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Excuse me. I heard your father say in Al-Kufa about them, he said, Wallahi qad malaltuhum wa abghatuhum wa maluni wa abghaduni. I have grown bored from them and yani, I have such hatred to them and they got bored from me and they hate me. This is Al-Kufa, uh, people of Al-Kufa who are now claiming to be supporting Al-Husayn. وَمَا يَكُونُ مِنْهُمْ وَفَاءٌ قط. Never loyalty comes from them. They're never loyal. They are such disloyal people. طيب, the point here is that all of these Sahaba, they knew exactly who the, those people of Al-Kufa are. And they knew how disloyal they are. And this is what they were trying to tell, to tell Al Hussein. They are lying to you. They are su such disloyal people. They have no wafa, no loyalty. Woman faza bihim faza bis sahmil akhyab. And whoever gets them on his side, this is what Ali ibn Abi Talib is saying. He's saying, whoever gets the people of Al Kufa on his side, he only got the futile share. Because they're futile, they're useless. They're useless. And if you remember when he was taking, يعني, uh, consulting them and trying, we remember when the, the, the disagreement with Muawiyah at the time, during his Khilafah, Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he was in Khalifa and there was a disagreement with uh, uh, Muawiyah, where he wouldn't pledge allegiance and he's like, giving, give me the killers of Uthman, my, in, my, my uh, kinship, right? Or my kin and I will pledge allegiance. Remember back then? And they were chaotic and they would disagree with him and everybody would speak in a different direction. They're so disloyal people. They're so disloyal. And he said, Wallahi ma lahum niyat. By Allah, they, they have no intentions. Yani they have no pure intentions, right? Yani they can be bought by money, they can be bought by anything, by <laughs> position. They would change. They have no pure intentions. And this is exactly what they did. And they have no strong will. Yani they're not firm upon if, if they agree on something or if the plan it calls to something, they, would, they have no strong will to carry it out. And they have no patience in fighting. They have no patience. Yani they would flee the, 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 the battleground. They don't fight. As for the people of Bilad al-Sham, they fight so hard. They fight so hard. Um, even subhanAllah, so these are some of Sahaba who advised Al-Husayn ibn Ali to not go out. Uh, when, what time, Aisha? 10.30. Oh, 10.30. 10.30, okay. Okay, inshallah ta'ala. Um, so these were some of the Sahaba who advised Al-Husayn ibn Ali not to go out. Even from non Sahaba, uh, there was a very famous poet called Al Farazdaq. Al Farazdaq was, is a very uh, famous uh, Arabic or Arab poet. Um, when Al Hussein was on his way en route to uh, Al Kufa, he met uh, Al Farazdaq, this poet. And uh, so, he to so he told him uh, from where, yani Al Hussein, he asked Al Farazdaq, the poet, he said, Where do you come from? He said, From Iraq. He said, And how, is the, yani, how are the people of Al Iraq? He said, Their heart is with you, but their swords is with Bani Umayyah. No loyalty, no whatsoever loyalty. They are so disloyal. Yani they wrote all of these letters, right? They tricked him into believing them. And they came in hundreds of, of messages, right? And then when he sent the Muslim ibn, ibn, Muslim ibn Aqil to find out and investigate, they came in thousands to pledge allegiance. But in reality, their source is with Bani Umayyah, yani with Yazid. No, dis no loyalty, no loyalty whatsoever. 
And despite that, subhanAllah, he insisted to go out uh, and he said, Allah al Musta'an. Allah al Musta'an, subhanAllah. Indeed, Allah al Musta'an. Tayyip. طيب. Now, Al Hussein ibn Ali, obviously, with those who accompanied him, his family and the family of his cousin, a Muslim ibn Aqil, and the few friends who accompanied him, uh, they, they continued on their way toward Al Kufa, right? They continued going toward Al Kufa. Um, on his way, he met that messenger that was sent by Umar ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas. Remember that wasiyah uh, that Muslim ibn Aqil told him to relay to Hussein to, to go back. On his way, he met and he got the news about the killing of Muslim ibn Aqil. So he learned that Muslim ibn Aqil in reality was killed and things have changed dramatically from يعني, the way that يعني, he, was, uh, he was thinking that it would be. And um, so Al Hussein, at that point, when he learned about that, يعني, he started to think about going back. He started to think about going back. And he talked to the children of Muslim ibn Aqil, because obviously he sent their father. So he talked to them and consulted among, uh, uh, with them. So they said, لا والله لا نرجع. By Allah, we will not go back until we re take revenge for our father. But in reality, this, يعني, uh, uh, يعني, this way of thinking, if you wish, or, or uh, يعني, this opinion of there is actually not a very wise, not a wise opinion. Because if you think about it a little bit more, how can you revenge your father and you're talking about armies now? You, you are only 73 or so. How can you revenge your father even if you are the most courageous person on earth? We're talking about completely two different يعني, sides that are, there's no comparison between them. There is no comparison, right? I mean, you're talking armies, you're talking state here, and you're 73. This is, isn't about shaja, this isn't about courage. This is, it about, this is about reason and preserving lives. There is no way. What can you possibly do? What can you possibly do? So they said, no, we will not go back uh, until we avenge our, our father. So he agreed with them because obviously, يعني, of, I'm thinking he's feeling some guilt that he caused the killing of their father. And um, when Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, remember the governor of Al Kufa? Right. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, when he learned about Al Hussein that he's on his way to Al Kufa, right? When he learned that he is on, already left Mecca and he is on his way uh, to Al Kufa, uh, he uh, sent Al Hur ibn Yazid al Tamimi. Al Hur ibn Yazid al Tamimi, he sent him out on top of a thousand men, an army of a thousand men. He sent him to meet Al Hussein in the way and to prevent him from reaching Al Kufa. To prevent him and to stop him from reaching Al Kufa. So he met with Al Hussein on the way in a place called Al Qadisiyah, which is in Iraq today. It's a, it's a city called Al Qadisiyah. And there was a battle, a major battle, if you remember, we talked about it, that happened, took there. Uh, so he met him in that place. And obviously, like we said, Yani al Hussein, he's only, uh, yani, there was no thinking of even fighting, right? So he's not coming with, a, with an army, he's only coming with those who accompanied him. Like I said, at most they put it at 73. And uh, Al Hur ibn Yazid al Tamimi, he was on top of a thousand men. So he said to Al Hussein when he met him, he said, Ila aina yabna binti Rasulillah. Where do you intend to go, O, o son of the daughter of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He said to Al Iraq, to Al Kufa. So he, so he asked him, Haven't you heard about the fact that Muslim ibn Aqil was killed? 
and all of the people deserted him and it's over. Yani there's not much he can do now. What, what do you want to do in the Kufa? Even if you get to Kufa, what, what are you, you going to do? It's over. There's nothing you can do, right? People, yani, the matter is over, right? It changed dramatically from the picture that you were given. Go back to where you, ca you came from because خلص, there's nothing. It's over. There's nothing you could do. Uh, but subhanallah, يعني, uh, like I said, قدر الله عز وجل uh, يعني نافذ نافذ يعني will happen no matter what. Al Hussein, even at that point, also يعني wanted because obviously يعني thinking wisely and يعني straight, خلاص, it's over. What can you do, right? So he's thought about going back. But again, the, يعني, the sons and the children of Muslim ibn Aqil, his cousin, uh, they insisted, they insisted that they would go forward uh, and يعني, go to ال, uh, until they reach Al Kufa. Again, like I said, يعني, subhanAllah, this is a situation where obviously Hussein ibn Ali, he realized that matter of fact, it's over. There's, and there's not much they're going to do, right? And it's only getting worse and worse and worse, right? So what's the point of going? But at the same time, it's the guilt that he is the one who caused the, the death of their father, right? He's the one who sent Muslim ibn Aqil, and these are their children, his children. So, يعني, it puts pressure, if you wish, right? It puts pressure. So, uh, he said, uh, he insisted that they were gonna, they're going to go forward. So, Al-Hur ibn Yazid, he said, I, uh, I was given the order to stop you, and I'm not going to let you to reach Al-Kufa. So go back and do not put me into a situation where Allah test me with your blood. Because he knew that things could يعني, get to a boiling point where things could go out of control and you know, things that are unintended could happen. He uh, definitely didn't want such a thing to happen. Al-Hur ibn Yazid, by the way, was a very noble man. Um, and يعني, he recognized the status of Al Hussein ibn Ali. Now, we're not talking about just any person here. We're not talking about any regular Muslim. We're talking about a person from Al Al Bayt. This is the immediate grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the only one who was alive at that point. Now, the only one who is alive, he is the only grandson who was alive at that at that point of time. And he recognized that. Yani he, Al-Hur ibn Yazid, he realized that. And that's why, if you remember, when he first asked him, he said, إِلَىٰ أَيْنَ يَبْنَ بِنْتِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ where, do you, where are you going? Or where do you, where do you intend to go? O oh, son of the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. son of Fatima, رضي الله عنها. So he said, uh, uh, I am ordering, I was ordered to stop you and يعني, prevent you from reaching Al Kufa and that you go back, send you back to where you came from. Don't, يعني, so that matters don't evolve into a situation where Allah uh, يعني, put me into a trial, test me with you. Uh, go back to where you came or go to Sham where Yazid is and talk to him. And don't go to Al Kufa because this, these are the orders that I was given to basically stop you. Al Hussein ibn Ali, he refused and insisted that he would يعني, continue his journey toward Al Kufa uh, in Al Iraq. And so he continued. And Al Hur ibn Yazid was trying as much as possible to keep it peaceful and, but to prevent him. So you can imagine Al, Al Hussein with the people who came with him. They're going toward the toward the Kufa and Al Hur ibn Yazid with his army, literally going يعني, in parallel with them, trying to stop him and prevent him, يعني, from reaching Al Kufa, uh, uh, marching with him. Uh, Al Hussein, at one point, he said, "Go away from me, thakilat ka ummuk." Thakilatka ummuk is, a, is, is an expression in the Arabic language where يعني, literally it means يعني, may your mother, when, when you, if you say to somebody thakilatka ummuk, يعني, may your mother, uh, how should I say this, uh, يعني, be sad about you, يعني, as if it is a, 
invocation that you die. يعني she would uh, lose you. Hey, it's like yeah, ثكلت كأمك. يعني may may your mother lose you. يعني you go you die you die. And that's not an easy statement. That's not an easy statement. Back in the days for the Arabs, that's a very a very يعني grave insult. That's a very insult. Um, so and like we said, Al-Hur ibn Yazid uh, al-Tamimi is from يعني from the most courageous. Uh, Arabs. He was a very courageous man and he comes from a very well-known tribe and he was one of the chiefs of his tribe. So, to, to be, so to, for somebody to say that's not an easy, it's a, it's a pretty I mean, big insult, it's not, not an easy thing, right? But look subhanAllah, still he was very respectful, very respectful of Al-Husayn ibn Ali and who he was. Look what he answered. He said, to Hussein ibn Ali, he got very angry by the way, he got very angry when he heard that, but at the same time he said, Wallahi law qalaha ghayruk, by Allah, if anyone else other than you said that, thakilatka ummuk, to me, from, from the Arabs, laqtasastu min, I would, I would have got his punishment, yani I would have punished him and his mother. If anyone from the Arabs other than you said that to me, I would have punished him and his mother. ولكن ماذا أقول? But, but, but at the same time, what should I say to somebody whose mother is سيدة نساء العالمين? What can I say to somebody whose mother, يعني فاطمة بنت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم, is the يعني uh, the سيدة of of the of the woman of the of the world? So this indicates that he recognized the status of Al-Husayn ibn Ali and the status of his mother, uh, the daughter of Rasulullah But he was given the order not to allow him to enter Al-Kufa. So he said, I will, not, I will still not allow you to enter Al-Kufa. I, will, I was given the order to prevent you from entering Al-Kufa. But obviously, Al-Husayn insisted and they kept going. And it kept going like that, right? So he's trying to march toward the Kufa, and the Hur ibn Yazid is trying to stop him from, from going there. طيب. Eventually, Al Hussein ibn Ali he reached a place. Eventually, he reached a place that is that was called Karbala, and I'm pretty sure you all heard of that place, right? طيب. Karbala or Karbula, it, is, يعني, it can be pronounced both ways. Karbula or Karbala. So he reached a place called Karbala. So he asked, what is, but he didn't know that it was called that as such. So he asked, what is this place called? What is, what is this uh, uh, town or village or whatever, the, uh, whatever it was? Uh, what is it called? So they told him it is called Karbala. So Subhanallah al Hussein. He split that word into two. And he said, Karbun wa bala. They told him, Karbala. So he said, This is Karbun wa bala. Al Karb is the distress. Al Karb is the distress. As Allah wa ta'ala uh, said, Qul may yunajikum. من ظلمات البر والبحر تدعونه تضرعا وخفية لئن أنجيتنا من هذه لنكونن من الشاكرين قل الله ينجيكم منها ومن كل كرب ومن كل كرب يعني الله عز وجل is who saves you from it and from every distress so the كرب is distress وبلاء trial بلاء يعني الابتلاء the test and trials um, so he said, this is a distress and trial. Yani he knew that yani some grave things will happen in here. This is, this is not going to be easy. This is a distress. Um, at that point, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, who is the governor of Al-Kufa, he uh, beforehand was preparing a, an army of 4,000 people. Uh, 4,000 people now. Um, uh, and he put on, on charge in charge of that army, Umar ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas. Remember who uh, uh, Muslim ibn Aqil, he gave him the wasiyah. So, and he was, he's an army general. So he put 
Sa'd ibn Abi, uh, Umar ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas on in charge of this army of uh, 4,000 people or th 4,000 men uh, and he was preparing that army to go for jihad. But he said, before you go there, go and meet with Al-Hur ibn Yazid and make sure you take care of the situation with Al-Husayn. He said, take care of that and then go. So he went to where Al-Hur ibn Yazid was and so when he reached there, so obviously the two armies now merged. So now how many people are we talking about? 5,000. There were 1,000 and now 4,000. So we're talking about 5,000 soldier men facing 73 people. There's obviously no comparison. Um, Sa'd ibn, Umar ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, he talked to Hussein and he ordered him to go with him to Al-Iraq where Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad is. He ordered him to come with him to Yazid ibn uh, Abdul, Abdul Ubaidullah ibn Yazid. So he refused. Uh, Hussein ibn Ali, he refused. Uh, but obviously at that point, يعني, it seems like it became very clear to Hussein that there is no way. يعني, at that point, I think he, was, he definitely understood the gravity of the situation. And there is nothing now you could do. What can you possibly do in front of an army of 5,000 men? It, it just, there's nothing you could do, right? It, it's not balanced. There's no balance here, right? It's not an equal fight. It's not a, no matter what you do, there's no way you could do this, right? It's not a fantasy. So he, I think he definitely understood that there's no reason and there's no benefit in continuing toward Al-Kufa. It's over, khalas. Yani at that point, he definitely understood that. So when he saw that the matter is, became, is becoming yani, more serious by the hour, as they say, right? He said to Umar ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, he said, okay, I give you three options. Inni ukhayiruka bayna thalathati umur. I give you the choice of three things. You choose whichever you want from it. So he said, what are they? Now, I want to point out that now, at this point, it was about the 7th or the 8th of Muharram. When did uh, al Hussein ibn Ali leave Mecca? 8th of Dhil? al Hijjah. So we're now almost one month after. Yani, almost one month has passed by from the time he left Mecca until this point. And obviously, yani, back in the days, the food and the drink that you bring with you, like how much it's going to last, right? How long? How much can you carry, possibly carry with you, right? So obviously the food and the drink started to dwindle and, you know, people started to get يعني, tired from the journey. It's not an easy journey, right? يعني, now if you travel for a few hours in an airplane, you, you get exhausted. You reach there exhausted. So we're talking here a month traveling in the desert, uh, on, uh, you know, camels or whatnot or horses. And uh, yeah, it's not easy. It's been a month. So he said, what are these three options? He said, either you let me go back, go back where I came from. That's number one. Number two, you let me go to any place where the Muslim are fighting jihad, thagr min thughur al-Muslimin, and I will go there and stay there. Or you let me go to Yazid in Sham to, يعني, to talk to him and to, يعني, uh, to have a dialogue with him directly. Because in the end, like I said, يعني, I want to remind you uh, and all the, the, those who are watching possibly that uh, Yazid ibn Muawiyah is no stranger from Al-Husayn. Again, he is a cousin. He, not a, well, I, I mean, you can say a cousin. He is a relative because remember, lineage-wise, they both come from Abd Manaf. So he is a cousin of Al-Husayn. Not only that, the wife of Yazid is also a cousin of Al-Husayn. Yani he married a cousin of Al-Husayn. And both sides realize that. 
And even Yazid, when he originally, if you remember early on, he sent a letter to Abdullah ibn Abbas, he reminded him of this lineage and this kinship that are between them. And he said, I don't want this to be broken. If Al Hussein goes out, this will be broken. So Al Hussein ibn Ali, he knows Yazid ibn Muawiyah, he's no stranger to him. He said, Or number three, let me go to Sham and I will put my hand in the hands of Yazid and I will talk to him. Umar, uh, uh, Umar ibn Sa'd, he said, that's, that's great. This is يعني, something very good. I wish you offered this beforehand. يعني, this is, يعني, you're offering this too late. I wish you offered you offer this early on. Now you're, you're offering this. But he said, you send to Yazid these options and I will send to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad because obviously Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad is the governor. He has to take his permission. He can't, he can't take a decision on his own. So he said, I will ask for the permission of Ubaid ibn ibn Yazid and look into the matter and see what he decides and you can send to Yazid. Al Hussein ibn Ali did not send to Yazid but Ubaid Allah ibn Ziyad, I'm sorry, uh, Umar, uh, Sa Umar ibn Sa'd, he sent to Ubaid Allah ibn Ziyad that this is what Al Hussein is offering, three options. And when the messenger uh, got to Ubaid Allah ibn Ziyad and he told him and that Al Hussein says these are the three things that I'm offering. Ubaid Allah ibn Ziyad immediately, he said, yeah, no problem. And he can choose whichever he wants, he, whichever one he wants. Yani at the first, he, he, gave him the, he gave him the option to choose whichever he wants, Al Hussein wants. But subhanAllah, one of the close advisors, one of the close advisors of Ubaid Allah ibn Ziyad, Oh, طيب. طيب. Let me just conclude with this sentence, inshallah. Uh, so we'll, we'll stop there. One of the advisors of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, uh, whose name is Shamr ibn Dhi al-Jawshan. Shamr ibn Dhi al-Jawshan. This was a very evil man. Very evil man. And he was, by the way, a Shia. <laughs> now, he's a Shia. And he was a very evil man. He said to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, you are the governor. How do you take the instructions from your prisoner? Al Hussein ibn Ali is now literally your prisoner. You could, you could dictate what you want. You're the governor. How can you take his instructions? And look, this shows the danger of evil advisors. We call them al bitana. Al bitana. And that's why, subhanAllah, governors, leaders should always have close advisors and intimate advisors around them who are good. Al-Bitana Saliha, the righteous Bitana, righteous advisors that give them the good advice, not the bad advice. And how often do leaders make wrong decisions or do something wrong just because of the bad advice that they receive from their advisors? And that's why, subhanAllah, and I finish by this, subhanAllah, one of the dua, one of the dua that, يعني, Salaf al-Salih, Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'een, and this continues as a tradition until now, in a lot of countries, including Saudi Arabia, when they make dua at the end of khutbah al-Jumu'ah, they make a dua for the righteousness of al-Imam, and ask Allah Azza wa Jal to surround him with good advisors. وَرْزُقْهُ اللَّهُمَّ الْبِطَانَةَ الصَّالِحَةَ Oh Allah, give him the righteous advisors because these can change minds and can يعني, lead the leader in the wrong direction. They can decorate things, evil things and wrong things in his eyes and convince him that this is what he should do. And subhanAllah, this is, look at this is a great example of that. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad originally, he said, yeah, no problem. Let him choose whichever he wants from them. All of them are good options. If he, if he wants to go back to Mecca, fine wants to go to a thaghr from thughur al-muslimin, to a place where they're fighting, no problem. He wants to go to Bilad, to Sham, to Yazid, no problem. He can choose whichever. He said, no, don't, you're the governor. How can you, how can you get instructions from your prisoner, subhanAllah? So immediately he said, yes, I am the governor. So he insisted that he would be taken a prisoner and brought to him. And from there, subhanAllah, things go, went, in a yani, very 
dramatic direction, subhanAllah. But uh, let's stop here, inshallah, and uh, we'll resume next week. Any questions or, or uh, comments? It started from that time. It started around that time, yes. Yes. Yeah. He was Shia. So, now, so it actually, it, it, just to answer your question, so it actually started from, yani the seeds of that group started from that time. And then it evolved. Right. By the way, Shia of today are not the Shia, not the same as the Shia of back, back then. They evolved a lot. Yes. They don't even look like those who, that existed at that time. And they even, by the way, they split into so many uh, groups even further. A lot of people, by the way, they mistake. They think that the Shia is one group or one sect. They are far from there. There are tens of sects, by the way, Shia. There are Shia al-Imamiyya al al-Ithna Ashariya, mostly in, in Iran and other places, who believe in the 12, uh, 12 they call them Twelvers, yeah. right? And there is a Shia al-Zaydiyya, mostly in uh, Yemen. There is a Shia al-Ismailiyya, they call them Ismaili. And there is al-Alawiyya, and many, 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 many tens, tens of, of, of uh, yani sects. May Allah يعني, uh, keep us uh, uh, firm upon the deen. Let's defer it until that point, inshallah. We're going to come to that, inshallah. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq. Naam, tafadal. Mahram and wali. طيب, just because it's يعني, not related, can, I, can we take this private, inshallah? طيب, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, uh, أسأل الله لي ولكم العلم النافع والعمل الصالح والإخلاص في القول والعمل هذا والله أعلم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته